I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a lecture for my professional responsibility class about ABA Model Rule 1.16 and spe specifically the 2023 changes to the rule to Section A. The ABA basically added an introductory sentence that created an affirmative duty for lawyers to inquire into the nature of the representation to protect against assisting the client with perpetrating or committing a crime or fraud. And then they added a subsection 4 to A. Now, A is about mandatory refusal or withdrawal from the representation. In other words, there are certain circumstances where no matter what the client wants, no matter what you want, no matter how many problems it's going to cause, you are not allowed to take a case or you are not allowed to continue with a case under certain circumstances. The rest of 1.16 is the same as it always was. So anything you've learned from other lectures or uh, test prep or reading the rules in the past about 1.16 is still true. It's all still there. They just added, there used to be three factors, now there's four. And really, to be honest, the fourth was implied already by the existing factors. I think that one, which said the client wants you to do something that violate the representation would violate the model rules of professional conduct or uh, the um, it would be uh, illegal under other law. Well, that includes crime or fraud, but they wanted to make it clear. And why did they do this? It's about money laundering. Lawyer, uh, people using law firms for uh, to launder money or to help with terrorist financing and things like that. And so they've added this and it's designed to prevent lawyers from turning a blind eye willfully or willful ignorance or blindness. Um, to what the client is actually doing. Instead, you have a duty to inquire, and that means for test purposes, yes, the lawyer could be subject to discipline for not inquiring. So having said that, let's dive in. The new introductory sentence says, a lawyer shall inquire into and assess the facts and circumstances of each representation to determine whether the lawyer may accept or continue the representation. So it, just make sure you understand that you have to do this assessment up front. And even if you did it before you undertook the representation, everything seemed fine and above board. If after the representation is underway, things start to change, or there's some red flags, the client is asking you to do something that you didn't expect and that there's no real good reason for, then you may have a new affirmative duty to inquire again and um, make sure that this isn't something criminal or fraudulent that's happening. So let's go back and look at the new subsection four. A lawyer must decline representation or withdraw from an existing representation if, for the client or prospective client seeks to use or persists in using the lawyer's services to commit or to further a crime or fraud, despite the lawyer's discussion pursuant to rules 1.2D and 1.4A5 regarding the limitations on the lawyer assisting with the proposed conduct. Now, just to re refresh your memory uh, without getting too far afield, 1.2 is about the scope of representation. And there's an explicit provision in 1.2D that no matter, even though normally you would defer to the client's objectives in the representation, even if it's not what you would do or you think it's kind of a dumb idea, um, but if it's criminal or fraudulent, you're just not allowed to do it. And you can't deflect onto, well, it was the client's idea and I'm just helping them, uh, you could be subject to discipline if you knowingly assist a client in crime or fraud uh, providing legal services. Now, here, you actually would have a duty to withdraw from the representation under those circumstances. 1.4 is the communication rule. And A5 uh, of that rule says, basically, if the client proposes something or asks you to do something that you're not allowed to do, because of the ethical rules or because of the law, you actually can't just ignore the request or be evasive. You have to say, I'm not allowed to do that, and here's why. Now, sometimes a client will back down and say, I didn't know. I, I had no idea that I was asking you to do something wrong and still wants to proceed with the representation and have you do other things for them, and then you can proceed. If they insist, no, 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 this is why I really hired you, or persist, they keep doing things using your legal services that you realize are criminal or fraudulent, you have to withdraw from the representation. Now, they added a few lines to the comments. The rest of the comments stayed the same. 
And the first is a change in the facts or circumstances relating to the representation may trigger a lawyer's need, and you should read duty, to make further inquiry and assessment. I have a picture here of a guy covering his eyes and looking away. Basically, you're not allowed to plead a defense of willful blindness or turning a blind eye to what the client is actually doing using your legal services. Um, on the contrary, you have a duty to look into it and ask some questions. And if they try to be evasive or refuse to answer your questions, then you have an even more duty uh, to ask your questions and find out what's going on. And sometimes, even though you've done a lot of due diligence at the outset and assured yourself that everything was above board, again, the circumstances may change that now trigger a new duty. So watch out for that. Um, and watch out for that as a test question, to be honest, where you have a lawyer and it looks like the lawyer was very careful at the outset of the representation, but then now something new has come up or there's new factors involved. Could they be subject to discipline for not um, making further inquiries? And the answer is yes. And then they give a couple examples that I think are likely to show up at some point as MPRE test questions, or at least on my exam. For example, a client traditionally uses a lawyer to acquire local real estate through the use of domestic limited liability companies with financing from a local bank. You know what? All of that is fine. Uh, if you have a client who has investment income, an inheritance or savings, or the, uh, they won a lottery or something like that, and they want to put some of it in real estate, that's not a bad investment for a lot of people. And they may hope that over time it will appreciate. So they have you help with the negotiations to for the purchases, you do the closings, you review the mortgage documents, you maybe you know people at a local bank. They have you incorporate some an LLC that to be a holding company or maybe a separate holding company for each property in the state. Why do you do that? It reduces the liability, um, helps partition the liability from property to property and probably reduces their insurance costs on it. So all of this is pretty normal and straightforward for a transactional lawyer. But let's say that later the same client asks the lawyer to create a multi-tiered corporation um, or corporate structure that's formed in another state. And to, they then they want you to acquire property in yet a third jurisdiction, and they still want to route the transactions through your trust account. Well, it's hard to see a good reason to do this, right? So none of this stuff that is described here, these extra steps are likely to just increase the return on investment. They're designed to make it harder to trace things back to the client um, himself or herself. And at that point, you should have some big question marks and you now have a duty to inquire further about what is really going on here. Um, and again, notice the difference between in-state forming cor out-of-state corporations um, and so forth, buying property in other states. They're trying to uh, avoid detection, it looks like. Here's the second example. You started a representation, everything seemed fine at the outset, but then a new party is named or new entity becomes involved. And so we're not talking about litigation where other parties plead into the case or new defendants are added or something like that. We're usually talking about transactional work. And the client came to you initially and said something like, look, I want to buy a property from this person. It sounded like a two-party transaction that's pretty straightforward. And then all of a sudden they bring in a new partner and then they want, it's going to be a three-way, four-way, five-way transaction. So the money's going to go to this person who's going to give it to this company who's going to do this. And then, well, they're using your firm to help launder money, probably. Um, and the same is true if instead of forming one LLC to hold their properties or uh, even an LLC for each property, they have multiple layers of shell corporations. It's hard to see a good reason to do that unless... They're trying to avoid something, and now you have a duty to ask some more questions. I'm going to wrap up here. Analysis under A4, the comments say, means that the required level of a lawyer's inquiry and assessment will vary for each client or prospective client, depending on the nature of the risk posed by each situation. And so, in other words, the they list some factors, like how long have you known the client? If it's somebody you don't know well, you've just met, that you have should have more red flags than somebody that you've done legal work for years, you know them, you know their family, 
Um, you know their financial history and so forth. Um, are they, where is this for tens of millions of dollars, or is it a, a, a lot less than that? And is the money coming out of nowhere? Are they having you put money in offshore bank accounts or offshore tax havens and um, things like that? They could be red flags. A really big red flag is if you ask the client some questions or ask for some documentation and they refuse to do it. They either ignore you or say, that's none of your business. I didn't hire you to look into my affairs or something. Well, guess what? Now you have even more of a duty uh, to look into it and to ask questions. And if they insist on, I'm not, you're better off not knowing, then you now have a duty to withdraw from the representation under this new change to the rules. They've made it very clear. So that concludes this little lecture about the 2023 amendments to Model Rule 1.16. Take a little break.